From the studios of KENW on the campus of Eastern New Mexico University, it's You Should Know, featuring the people and events of Eastern New Mexico and West Texas. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Evelyn Ledbetter. I'm your host for You Should Know. And my guest today is Dr. Don Donald, Doc Elder. Doc, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Evelyn. It's nice to have you. So let's talk about a little bit of your, your time at Eastern after you left Redlands and came to the, uh, the wetlands of, of southern New Mexico, right? Yeah, I am reminded of the line from Casablanca where Claude Rains asked Humphrey Bogart how he ended up in Casablanca. And he says, I came for prayer for the waters. And he says, <laughs> waters? What waters? We're in the middle of a desert. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart shrank shrugs and says I was misinformed so that's <laughs> kind of but no it was I wanted a small community to raise my family in and uh, this definitely fit the bill and Eastern is a school that puts its emphasis on teaching and that's what I think colleges should devote their time to and so I felt like this was the place I wanted to call home. Well I know in past conversations you had taught at Redlands after you got your doctorate and the the smog was a little tough um, close to the Dodgers and, and close to the beach. Pluses and minuses, right. yes, exactly. Well, and, and you came here and interviewed, and actually um, our former president, Dr. Caldwell, was um, in the planning and what was the title She was point? the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Okay, at that so point. I, I tell people you can either credit her or you can blame her <laughs> with the fact that I'm here. Well, I'm going to send a thank you note. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So when you came on board, um, obviously history was, was what you taught. So tell us a little bit when you got, how did your family settle in? For my son, Brian, it was a really tough adjustment because all he knew was Southern California. Oh. And uh, this was like the first move that had ever happened. And so it was kind of a tough adjustment, especially because there was no Chuck E. Cheese or Toys R Us anywhere to be seen on the horizon as opposed to Southern California. That's My true. son Cam had an easier time because he was in sports, and so he started right in with the off-season basketball okay. and developed a group of friends, and so he kind of took to it immediately. Brian was a little bit longer sell to get him to like Portellus. How old were they? Uh, Brian was going into third grade. Cam was going into 10th grade. Oh, so big, definitely. Yep. Big adjustment on that. Yep. Big adjustment. So, so the draw? Is just a small town it talked to you? It was the community, it was the university. Uh, the university wanted somebody to be able to teach American military history, to teach Civil War and Reconstruction, and to teach the Social Studies Methods class. Well, those were all three classes I was teaching at the University of Redlands, so I couldn't have drawn up a job description that more accurately portrayed what I was able to do if I'd done it myself. And <laughs> you wrote your own. I, you th wrote, exactly. You wrote exactly. Your own. Like, what can I do? And, uh, <laughs> check, check, check. And so I was hired. And when I came here, I just hoped to be a good teacher and hoped to coach the Little League. And then uh, all of a sudden, out of the blue in February, I got a call from Sandy Bergman who owned the radio stations okay. in this part of the world at the time. And she said, well, do you ever listen to the radio on Wednesday nights? And I said, yeah. And she said, do you ever listen to a program called The Coach's Show? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, it's Wednesday. My host isn't going to be able to make it in oh. time. And his car broke down on the road. Could you fill in? And I had had a little bit of broadcast experience, not very much. I had Back done play-by-play -play for... Vinton High School uh, <laughs> color commentary because they brought cable to town. Mm -hmm. And so for I did five football games one year, five football games another. Uh, but my wife, who was the administrative assistant for the Chamber of Commerce at the time, had told Sandy oh, okay. kind of jokingly, oh, yeah, my husband's had experience broadcasting. <laughs> and, and Sandy took her seriously <laughs> and called me up. And so got a chance to fill in on the coach's show. And well, that was kind of fine. And then next day she called him and said, do you want that job permanently? And it turned out that the guy who was the host wanted to get out. He had been looking to get rid of this responsibility. And so I became the host of the coach's show. And then baseball season was starting. And she asked me if I wanted to broadcast baseball. And 
Baseball was my first love. As I tell people, if sure. my fastball hadn't topped out in low 70s, <laughs> I was going to be a professional baseball player. I was that close. <laughs> I was that close. Only 20 miles an hour off the radar gun. Um, mm. And so I got a chance to broadcast uh, baseball. And then she asked me if I wanted to do all Eastern athletics. And long line, I picked up uh, high school broadcasting. And then she needed somebody to fill in on a morning show. And I was supposed to be for two weeks, and that was oh. back in 1999. And I'm still on in the morning, <laughs> 24 oh. years later. What time do you get up? I, I I have a precise schedule, Evelyn. I get up at 5:45 in the morning and get out to the station and record sports that air on other stations that the company owns. And then Kevin Robbins and I are on at 6:30 in the morning. And, you yeah. don't take much beauty prep, do you? I, no, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm a guy, and I brush my teeth uh, and, and I kind of comb my hair. But when you're on radio, you don't. Unlike the two of us who are on television and have oh. to spend time, you know, worrying about the optics of uh, how we look. Right. Radio, right. you just show up, and as long as you've got a voice, you're you're okay. <laughs> and and you know, you're lucky you don't have a face for radio. We actually have the face for tv as well so there you go uh, <laughs> so since 1991 99 since 1999 i've been doing the since 96 i've been doing sports uh 99 was when i started doing radio and then in 2012 uh richard rivera was the executive producer of k and w mm -hmm. programming and he called me up one day and said hey doc we need somebody for sports look and would you like that and it's like I'd watch sports like my whole time here. Dallin Sanders was the host back in the day when I moved to Portales. And so it's like, wow, that'd be a lot of fun. And it just worked into my schedule that I was able to uh, show up when they wanted to tape. And so it's been my privilege to host sports like since 2012. And actually, you're basically doing a double header tonight. You just taped sports like a few minutes ago. And and now just popped over into a different set and, yeah. and uh, graciously came on air again with me. So and it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, I go from being the interviewer oh. to being the interviewer. Oh, well, no pressure. I was sitting back in the in the room a little in the control room, and I said, "Oh, I'm following a pro. This I don't know. <laughs> this is a lot different to be on the other side with Doc." But I said, "He'll carry it and make this look well." <laughs> so. Well, you're asking very intelligent questions. Oh, so well, you know. So what is the passion? You just love knowing all about the sports and being involved and I, I tell people to continue I, doing this for so long. Well, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to have won quite a few awards. Twelve, actually, right? New Mexico Broadcasters Association, possibly. Somewhere in that vicinity. I uh, you're on Wikipedia, by the way. Wow! <laughs> you have made the big. That. You have made the big talk. <laughs> I, I feel so honored. But I, I tell people, Evelyn, in in all seriousness, that I don't. I didn't really win those awards. It's the student athletes that really won the awards because they're the ones that are providing the exploits. And all I try to do is find words to describe what's taking place on the court or the field. So. I give all the credit mm -hmm. for the awards that I've won to the student athletes, and they're just. They they try hard. We're we're not always the best team in terms of talent, but quite often we're the best team in terms of effort. And as long as Greyhound men and women go out and give it their all, I'm happy to go wherever and whenever to broadcast their games. Well, and we were talking, um, you know, your games. We've got one coming up that's going to be at Alpine, and the drive down there and getting back. Those are late nights. They so. are, but I'm I'm fortunate that I love to drive. I I've never fallen asleep at the wheel. I mean, that's good. metaphorically I have, but you know, literally I've <laughs> literally never fallen you asleep at the wheel. So as long as I feel that I'm not a hazard to myself or anybody on the roadways, I love driving and doing the games. Do you take your kids with you when they were little? When when I was little, I. When sort of. when Brian was little, he okay. was the guy that had to go. Cam was old enough, and he had his own car. And it's like, okay, as long as nothing is different about this house when we get back, it, <laughs> then it will leave you on your own. But Brian got to go to exciting places like Stephenville, Texas, and Abilene, and every place in between. And well, so you, you find fun stuff in all those spots. 
But it was interesting because Cam went into broadcast journalism. He became, for back in the days, Bergman Broadcasting and then Rudy Moon Broadcasting. Mm -hmm. He was the voice of the Portales Rams. Sure, I remember listening to him, though. And he, he was the one that really has the talent in the older family broadcasting-wise. Mm -hmm. But Brian, growing up around broadcasting, where literally he didn't really remember a time when his dad wasn't on the radio. No interest in that whatsoever. <laughs> Just, just that's dad. There's yep. nothing special about that. And yeah. neither of the boys now are involved in broadcasting at all. They went for the big dollars, Evelyn. They, <laughs> they, I raised them well. They are financially uh -huh. to the point where they make way more than their dad. And I get a really nice salary from, from Eastern, but uh, they yeah. uh, put me to shame. And that's that's the way it should be. Well, you're always... not going to end up on the couch or anything like sure, that. Sure, sure. So you're still doing the sports announcing here. Uh, explain a little bit. I know you said that uh, the rules that there has to be announcing provided to the NCAA, correct? Will you the walk Lone Star Conference adopted a policy where any Lone Star Conference team playing, even if it's not a Lone Star Conference uh -huh. contest, you have to provide video and audio for those contests. Okay. So Eastern has to have a crew out filming and they have to have somebody doing play-by-play. -play. And uh, Paul Weir, the athletic director mm -hmm. at Eastern, asked me last year, he said, Doc, we can't pay you right now. We, you know, <laughs> down the road, it'd be, it'd be nice, but if you can work it into your schedule. And so, um, because I'm totally invested in Eastern and the student athletes, well, it's like as you. often as I can. Thank you for that. I mean, not, not many, you have to have a passion for that because otherwise the, the time and the effort and the expense is, is pretty great. So, yep. well, the love of the game. It is, and I love sports. And uh, like I said, as long as Eastern kids are trying their hardest and putting forth maximum effort, I'm happy to be out there and broadcasting the contest. And it's, it, it's something I never saw when I was growing up. I mean, I never dreamed for an instant that I'd have any sort of a connection with broadcasting and to be able to host a radio show on a country station. <laughs> on a country Portales, station. New Mexico. And <laughs> no, no less a country station, which you are not the one that listens to that type of music. Well, I wasn't before, before. I got here, but uh, <laughs> you can't live in this part of the world and not develop an appreciation for country music. But can you two-step yet? <laughs> I there there is a person who is watching this program who might dispute, but I think I'm a pretty good dancer. So. <laughs> but, we, we, we'll just leave it. We won't invite, yeah, so we won't invite that person. I'll leave it to her to, to actually uh, have the last word on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I always like to dance. I mean, you know, back in the day, it was the twist and the holly golly and the swim and you know so. Uh, and was, then disco. Was, and disco. Was I like I could disco with the best of them. Maybe not go. John Travolta level, but. I, Not bad. I was, I was pretty good back yeah, in the day. Yeah. Yeah. So, so sports has been a huge deal. Still involved with that and then moved into, tell me about the world of teaching. The, the, the thing that keeps you drawn in. What keeps you there? I, I love teachers who made me see things or helped me see things. They didn't make me, but they helped me see things from a different perspective, right. a different point of view who helped me look beyond my narrow frame of reference and see that there was a bigger world. I love teachers who taught cause and effect, who taught uh, similarities and differences, uh, comparison and contrast. And so it was like, I thought to myself, if I can't be a pitcher for the Dodgers, which was career goal number one. Uh, then What's number two? What's, number, what's, what's, what's two second? Is, uh, I, um, then it was kind of like, okay, do I want to be a real doctor and like take out tonsils and things <laughs> like that? And I I had a, an experience where I, I got an A in a biology class at Northwestern, but it was like, there was no way I should have gotten an A. And it was like, I don't want to be a doctor knowing only this much information. <laughs> that, that it was graded on the curve. <laughs> it was graded on the curve, exactly. And so it was like, okay, I got to be that kind of doctor. So it's like, all right, then I want to be a teacher. And I, I love it. And I just, I was so jazzed this year because I found out I was going to be able to teach three classes in person. Right. And that's just, that's That's where you need me. to be, yeah. is in front of people, because truly you do get challenged. So I don't want to delve too hard into politics, but they've taken civics basically out of school. 
thought process on the effects that has had on our political climate of people understanding now? Well, here again, talk about cause and effect. I think there's a direct causal relationship between the fact that we don't put as much emphasis on social studies as when I went to right. school. You're a lot younger than I am, so you know. Not, but, not a lot. <laughs> but you know, back in the day, there were a lot of social studies classes that were required, and especially right. uh, government. And that was your civic duty. That's where mm -hmm. you learned about being an American. And I, I get it why we need STEM. I mean, we've got to be competitive in the world, so we've got to put emphasis on science and technology right. and reading. But You need to know the laws of the land and how things work. Exactly. When I went to school, we had driver's ed one semester, and the other semester was civics. And you learned how you went about passing laws and why you don't always get what you want. Yeah. And, and the principle I, of compromise. And when you said, you know, truly, you know, in a classroom, you're engaging students to think a different way. The thoughts that you can talk with somebody about politics and be willing to have an open mind and yep. think and look. Yep. Do you see a difference in the classroom on that today? Unfortunately, I, I do. I, I feel that students aren't quite as open-minded, but then that it makes it more fun uh, because then you've got a challenge. It's like, okay, how do I help kids understand that there's a different point of view, and that just because you have a particular frame of reference, that's not the only frame of reference. And so try and have some empathy, empathy. try and put yourself in another person's right. shoes. And so that's, that's my goal now. And I, at the end of the day, if I feel like I've helped students see that maybe there is another way of looking at things, then I've done good for that group of kids, but I've also done good for America in general. I know, you know, watching news today, I want the facts and then I want to decide for myself. Yep. Um, some of that, it's the same things, you, the facts of what the wars and civil war and the American history. And yep. There was the one time in our nation that we didn't compromise and right. that was the result. So that's why I point to people, you got to give a little, you got to get a little. That's just the nature of America. When we do that, we're the greatest country on the face I agree. of the earth. I agree. Yeah. Work together on things. And and um, do you, special, I'm gonna guess, you still have students that probably stay in touch with you? I do. I, I have kids that I taught in Vinton, Iowa that still send me holiday cards and I, I stay in touch with. And I, it's great every once in a while, somebody will reach out and see that they saw something on like Facebook about me and they'll, they'll contact me. So it, as a carpenter, if you build a house, if it stays in one piece, you know you did a good job. As a teacher, you don't often know whether you did a good job unless students take the time to reach out years later and say, hey, you really helped me out, and thanks. I ran into my high school uh, history teacher, or English teacher, about a month ago, Karen Kibbe, and actually I hadn't seen her since I graduated and had an opportunity to say, thank you for everything you did. Your teaching has, has done a lot for me and where I've went in life. So it felt good to be an adult and actually be able to say thank you. I couldn't agree more. So that's a huge part of life. Yep. So so going forward, um, thoughts here on the campus and goods and bads and... On campus, I really like, and I'm not just saying it because he's my boss, but I really like Dr. Johnson because he wants to bring kids to campus. He wants in-person classes. I totally get why we need to offer some classes online, but... Uh, I'm an old school kind of person because I am old school. I and so <laughs> you're, I you're you're seasoned. I'm, I'm seasoned. I'm mature, <laughs> but I really like the energy on campus. We've got a lot more kids and just we do. roaming around and seeing kids. It's just like you you pick up the vibes from those kids. It's like yeah, this this school is is definitely heading in the right direction. When I looked out the window today, it was nice to see so many cars in the parking lot. I hadn't seen that in quite a while. Yep. And when I was a student here, you couldn't hardly drive nope. on campus during class changes and things like that. Exactly. So we had a Coke salesman come in regional and he said, our sales are down. What's going on? I said, we, nearly ever, a lot of things are online. Yeah. And that, that experience in socialization and yeah. communication, communication is huge when, when you don't have in person. Nope. I was yeah. talking to Dr. Dobson this morning and she was talking about the, the kids that missed out on class for several years and how that's you see the effects exactly are you seeing that as well i do 
it, it's taken a while, but now kids are becoming more comfortable being back in the classroom and I'm getting a little bit more interaction with them. I, I keep trying to find music analogies that work with them. I find some of my music analogies just go right over their heads. But talking about Katy Perry or Lady Gaga, and it's like, okay, where do those people? And so I try and keep my classes as relevant to my uh, constituents as I can. Well, it helps if you're doing the radio too. You're listening to modern music and, oh, and songs. And I can country music with the best Morgan Wallen and all those. People. You're yeah, ahead I'm of like, me. I'm, I'm kind of stuck back in back in some of the later the later days. So, so what are you teaching this semester? So this semester I get to teach in person well, said, survey class, okay. and I get to teach Civil War, and I get to teach Social Studies methods. So those are my three in person. I am teaching one online history, what we used to call 101. It's now 1110, but first half of US, and then I teach an introduction to historical methods for people that are just kind of, well, do I want to go into history? And well, this is what historians do. The dual enrollment? Dual enrollment, I, that's my online, is that okay. I've, I've got kids from Dora, I've got kids from Portal, I've got a couple from Floyd. Uh, so. Do you want to tell? Some people may not be aware of what the dual enrollment is. Dual enrollment's a program where a high school student can take a, a class at Eastern New Mexico University, get credit for a high school social studies class, and get university credit. So they're killing two birds with one stone. And they're being able to take that with no charge of tuition, correct? Nope, exactly. So kiddos in those years take advantage. Take your English and your basically your basics. Exactly. I know a lot of students come in here and they're they're coming in as a sophomore. They've yep. already got thirty credits on that, which is pretty amazing. Exactly. And they've got a little head start of knowing what college life and the curriculum and the step up is on that. I couldn't agree more. It's a great so. idea. Just shows that life can get better, I think. You know, I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't change. Right oh, now. I wouldn't either. <laughs> I enjoy the heck out of all four years of my college experience and then six years of grad school. You've just had a college experience ever since you were 18. Oh, I tell you, I've you been on one quit. side of the desk or the other or, my whole or life. Or teaching. I, I've either been a student or I've been a teacher my whole life. Well, I'll, I'll highly recommend to all of our viewers, um, if you get a chance to take a class with Doc Elder, whether you're in college or out, please do that. I so. would be honored. So what do you think life brings for you going from this point on? Well, in, in the last two years, Evelyn, I, I saw both of my sons get married. I became a grandfather. I am going to be a grandfather of three children by Christmas time and uh, met an amazing woman and started a relationship with her. And so I... Now, if I could just figure out what I want to do when I grow up, that's, that's the one question I've got. But no, life, life has blessed me, and I'm, I'm in a great place in my personal life and my professional life. and just happy to be here and uh, just thrilled to be a part of Eastern New Mexico mm -hmm. University, KNW, and Life on the High Plains. Well, you bring so much into the station and so willing to, to teach and donate your time, which we're so thankful for on, on that. So we're going to chain you to the desk. You know, we have expectations of like Dr. Jack Williamson of you're going to have to stay for a oh, long time. We have had, but uh, I found out that one of my very best friends, Alan Garrett, whose wife works here at k and he's going to retire after only 32 years. And it's like, you slacker, you can't quit. <laughs> you can't quit. You haven't hit even close to 40. So exactly. You can't do that. And, yeah, and, and lots of great things um, are said about him on campus yeah. and different ones. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, just the grandbabies, son, little boys, little girls? Well, amazingly enough, I, I had uh, two sons, and then uh, my son Cam had a son, and my son Brian is going to have a son. So there's one grandchild out there that uh, the sex has not been determined yet, so I might mm -hmm. eventually have a female, but uh, you know, it's been Those pretty are... much of a male lineage that has and passed wow. down from me to future generations. Well, I, I can say those little ones are very lucky to, to have you, the, like the cool grandpa, right? I don't know what they call you, but the cool grandpa. <laughs> and and you, do you want to do a little shout out? We don't, we're winding down, but a shout out to the lady that you're hanging out with. Well, I, she uh, came into my life in kind of similar circumstances where we would both lost our spouses about the same time. And just, um, we ran into each other at a time when we could uh, become a, a relationship. And so it's 
Well, definitely I... puts a smile on my face even more so than uh, Very... just the fact that I get to be Doc Elder in general. Well, it's, it's nice to see that. I had actually met her last year and really liked her and then saw you together, and that's really cool. So, well, that wraps it up for us, Doc. Evelyn, it's been a pleasure. It and has... Congratulations on the job you're doing with You mm. Should Know, and we're training young people that are going to go out and be great successes in their professional career. Well, we're, we're, I'm blessed to be where I'm at. So, so to all of you out there, thank you for watching, and we will see you next time on You Should Know. Cheers.